Utah and San Diego. Okay, so today joining us on the line, we have uh, Trent Demuzio. Um, he's an application engineer with YSI. He's joining us from uh, his home office in Logan, Utah. Um, Trent's been working with uh, the company and this, this type of equipment for over 13 years. He started with uh, de design analysis and is now um, working for YSI. His background's in electronics and he knows the equipment inside and out application applications very well. Um, he's worked in repair, R&D, and now as an application engineer and specialist with equipment. Also on the line we have uh, Dr. Anders Tenenberg. Um, he's a product manager and um, scientific, scientific advisor at Andra. He's been there for the last 20 years. In, in parallel, he's an associate professor at the Department of Marine Sciences at the University of Gutenberg in Sweden. Uh, in, his, in this role, he's um, focused on technical development and the use of underwater sensor technology and autonomous platforms. He's been a contributor on more than 40 peer-reviewed scientific papers. And my name is Isaac Jones. I'm a product manager here at Sontech in San Diego. Um, I've been with Sontech for five years and I've had experience with uh, tech support and application engineering and come from a background of uh, earth science and uh, oceanography and uh, did work um, in my master's thesis with acoustic instruments and that's kind of how I ended up working for Sante. And so um, today we're going to take kind of take everyone through application examples and, and different instrumentation from uh, kind of coastal waterways, so rivers and estuaries, and then out into the, the near shore surf zone, and then into the deep blue ocean with application examples from, from Andra. Um, and I'll mention here, uh, during the presentation, if you have any questions, uh, please chat, um, send them to us via the, the chat function. Everyone's only in listen-only mode, so that's how we can get questions. And then at the end, we'll, we'll have a, a Q&A session and answer as many questions as we have time for. Um, if we don't get to your question, I apologize, but um, know that we'll, we'll send a follow-up email that will have all the questions asked during the webinar via the chat. So please please send them in and, and our answers to those. Uh, in, in addition to that, you can look for uh, the recorded webinar and the, the, the PowerPoint and, and different links will be sent out in that email, um, that follow-up email as well. So keep an eye out for that after, after the presentation. So quick overview of what we'll go over today. Um, Trent will be presenting first and he's going to go over some different ways to uh, measure water level with uh, equipment from YSI. Uh, so first, talking about water level and air gap measurement with a Nile radar, and then water level measurement using the Amazon bubbler. Um, then he'll pass it back to me, and uh, I will present some, some Sontech solutions uh, for measuring uh, currents, uh, water level, and waves with our Sontech SL. And then, uh, then I'll talk a little bit about our XR ADCP, also for measuring current levels and waves and talk about some applications. And then finally, I'll talk about um, our Sontech ADV uh, and measurements of current velocity in the surf zone. Then I'll pass it back to uh, Dr. Anders Tenenberg, and he will talk about pressure-based wave tide and depth uh, and some specifications on some monitor equipment for measuring these things. And then uh, he'll go into some applications and, and some examples where customers are measuring water level, waves, uh, seafloor stability, um, some, some deep sea measurements. 
finally, he'll wrap it up with uh, introducing a brand new product from, from Andra, uh, a little preview uh, of the MODIS uh, directional wave sensor for hydrographic and navigational buoys. Okay, so now um, I'm going to hand it over to Trent. He's going to talk about the, the Nile radar and the Amazon bubbler seen here on the, the image. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it to him. Hang with us for a minute. Okay, thank you, Isaac. I appreciate that. Hello, everyone. Uh, as Isaac said, we are going to start out today uh, talking about the radar. I'm going to go through some application examples and and uh, hit on one uh, optimization feature that I think uh, bears uh, is important to talk about. Uh, before we get uh, too far into it, let me just explain a little bit about what the radar is, how it works. Um, the radar uses what we call time of flight measurements. Uh, it has a sensor that uh, sends out a 26 gigahertz signal. That signal uh, reflects off of a target surface and then is reflected back to the sensor and it measures the time it takes for that uh, signal to get reflected back and that's how it calculates uh, the, the distance to, to the surface, um, the surface target. And that's what radar is doing. And that signal is going to reflect off of just about anything it hits um, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. but. Uh, as we install it correctly, it will reflect uh, the song, strongest signal strength off of our target, which is which is water. Um, getting into some of the applications, uh, radars are uh, typically used to measure water level. Um, this is a site in uh, the city of Chicago along the Chicago River that is operated by the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District there in Chicago. This was an existing site that the customer had. Then um, they had a, a dissolved oxygen probe there measuring. And they decided that they wanted to add a continuous level monitoring station to that site. They had some criteria that they wanted to, that they needed to, to, to have uh, as they selected a sensor. They wanted a non-contact sensor so that they could uh, drastically reduce uh, the maintenance that would be required in that area. Um, they also wanted an easy communication and setup uh, to the existing data logger there, and they wanted some real-time data. Um, and the radar ended up uh, suiting their needs very well. You can see there the radar is a non-contact sensor, and after the radar is um, installed and set up, there really is no maintenance short of monitoring battery. Um, there's no maintenance really required uh, for the radar. And it does easily set up and communicate it. Communicates SDI 12, so it will easily communicate to any uh, existing data logger that has SDI 12 capability, which is just a, a three-wire connection. Um, and if you look there on the right-hand side, the picture that's the the data logger there that's set up. It's a Storm 3 data logger with a with a built-in cellular modem, which added telemetry to the site and gives the the customer 15 minute data transmissions to their uh, their cloud, their data cloud hosting solution. So they are able to get real-time data. Um, so now at that site, they've got uh, the DO uh, probe measuring, the water level measuring, and they're, they're able to get 15-minute uh, data. And uh, it's been running for uh, probably around six months now, and it's been working really well for them there. Um, not only is the is the radar uh, well suited to measure uh, water level, but it's also uniquely suited to measure air gap. As I kind of mentioned before, what the radar is doing is it's measuring the distance from itself to the target surface, um, which in our case is water, and that's what air gap essentially is. So on a bridge, a radar would be mounted, and it's it's going to constantly be measuring the distance between itself and the water surface. An air gap becomes kind of an important piece of information in areas where uh, commercial boat traffic is is present. The captains of these vessels use that use that air gap data um, so that they can safely navigate their their vessels underneath bridges. And in this example, the customer was really what they wanted is they wanted um, an instrument that they could uh, monitor the water level as well as the air gap. And the radar is uniquely suited to do this. Um, 
But made a measuring solution that's worked out really well um, for them in that situation. Um, this is a, kind of a neat application. This is a site uh, run and operated by NOAA. Uh, NOAA, in in partnership with the Mobile County Commission, established uh, eight different uh, water level observatories for storm surge monitoring um, in the Mobile Bay. In the U.S., along the uh, several of their coastal cities, um, probably over the last 10 years, they've experienced at least two, maybe more, severe storm events, hurricane-type storms that that's caused a lot of problems. Um, and so they wanted to start to monitor these storms and be able to get data from these storms. Um, in order to do that, there was two unique challenges that um, they're dealing with. The first is during a severe uh, storm event, the water levels will rise and can rise to very high levels and rise very rapidly. Um, so they needed a sensor that could be up out of that uh, water level and away from that danger. Um, with the water level rise, you also get uh, very high water flows. And so they also needed a sensor that wouldn't be affected by the extreme water flows during a, a severe storm event. And so the radar, again, was uh, kind of uniquely suited to, to solve these problems. Um, several of those radars are mounted above uh, Category 5 storm surge heights, and that does not affect uh, their ability to measure the water level. Um, and then also the, the high flows that can occur, the very high flows that can occur, don't affect uh, a radar's ability to measure uh, the water level. And so they're able to take data from these sites, combine that with uh, data from existing sites, uh, meteorological data, tidal data from other existing sites, and they combine that all together uh, to provide some really critical information for coastal resource management and also for uh, emergency management. Um, the, uh, uh, they're able to get, get data both uh, before, during, and after a storm event. And then if you look, um, if you look down at the uh, uh, zoomed in picture there, you can see that we've got some other equipment going on. We've got uh, a solar panel, some antennas, and they were able to add uh, satellite transmissions, uh, satellite radios to the site that, that provide hourly transmissions and uh, provide uh, real near real-time data to the, to the customer, and they're able to see this data even during a storm event. So it's kind of a neat, a neat setup that's worked out very well. Um, here's an application. Uh, this is in uh, St. Lucia. This is a United Kingdom territory in St. Lucia, and this is a site that's, that's operated by um, the, the National Oceanographic uh, Center in Liverpool. Um, this is an, uh, an area where they're, they're using radars to measure uh, uh, tides, their tide gauging here. Um, typically, they use submersible pressure transducers, but they were wanting to move to uh, a non-contact sensor to reduce some of the maintenance that's required there. Um, but uh, in, in, in doing so, they were very uh, conscious of the quality of data they would get from a radar and concerned about that, wanting to make sure that they would get uh, good, accurate data. Um, and this uh, particular radar um, has, a, has some different measure mode capabilities, and they have a measuring mode that we call the NOAA mode. It's a mode that was requested by NOAA. Um, and, and you can send a specific measure command to the radar that will cause that radar to measure for a period of time. In this instance, it's one minute. It'll take uh, measurements uh, over a one-minute period. It calculates a standard deviation, uh, removes the outliers, and then returns an average. And so it, it can provide very accurate data. And these, these radars are being tested at several sites there in St. Lucia, and they're being measured uh, currently alongside of the pressure transducers, and that's been, been tracking very well and working uh, very well for the customer down there um, in their tide gauging stations. 
Um, here's a just a feature that I think is kind of unique and um, important to note here on the radar uh, for optimizing your measurements. We talked early on that there's a, a signal that uh, the radar emits that reflects off of surfaces. Um, it's uh, really important when you uh, establish a radar site that you provide a clear path to the water surface. Um, that's not always completely possible. And so you can see here in the picture that we're going to get a reflection off of a bridge pier. Um, we're going to get a reflection off the, sur uh, the bank, one off of the other bank, and then here uh, finally at the water surface uh, 50 feet away. Um, and this graph shows signal strength um, and distance. And this is a, an actual graph taken from a radar. This is what the radar actually sees. And in this instance, what the radar is going to see is it's going to see a reflection here. You get this uh, spike in signal strength, and that's the, the, the pier, the bridge pier. Here's one bank, and then the other bank. And then you see at 50 feet, uh, the largest uh, signal strength uh, echo there is from the water surface. But these false uh, echoes, um, can cause problems with your with your data quality. And so the, the radar has this feature called mapping that allows it to essentially learn its path to water. And we map to about two feet off the surface of the water. So if the water is at 50 feet, we're going to map to 48 feet. And what the radar is going to do is it's going to look at all these reflections it gets to the 48 foot um, uh, distance there, and then it's going to mathematically remove those. And so what the radar actually sees is a nice smooth transition here to the signal uh, echo of the water level of the water surface. And, and so that is just a, it's a really nice feature that the radar has that allows us to clean up some of the false echoes that we don't want to see and improve our, our, uh, our data from the radar. Okay, moving on here, we're going to talk a little bit now about uh, the Amazon bubbler. I wanted to uh, just take a second and explain what a bubbler is, what it does. I don't know how many are familiar with bubblers, but the bubblers, they operate on a principle of physics that says um, that at any point in a body of water, the pressure at that point is directly related to the height or the amount of water above it. So as the water level increases, the pressure on our orifice line also goes up. As the water level decreases, the pressure on our orifice line follows and goes down. And so all a bubbler is trying to do is it is pushing a calibrated bubble at a certain rate out its orifice line and into the water. And the pressure that it takes to push that bubble out the line directly relates to the amount of water above the orifice line. Okay, so as the, as the water level goes up, the pressure it takes for the Amazon or the bubbler to push a bubble out the line also goes up. As the water level drops, the pressure it takes to push that bubble out also drops. And so all the bubbler is doing is it's very accurately reading the pressure in this orifice line, and then we're able to take that pressure and convert it to a, a unit of distance, like feet or meters, millimeters, whatever uh, the user wants. And what that does is it allows us to very accurately track the rise and fall of the water level. And that's what a bubbler is doing. Um, <clears throat> bubblers are very widely used by the U.S. Geological Survey. Um, this pictures, these pictures here are not actually USGS site, but they're modeled after uh, the USGS and, and how they set up their sites. This is actually a canal um, in, in Nevada that's responsible for providing irrigation water to uh, around 400,000 acres of farmland. Um, that's, uh, in that area, that's the, the main um, economic source is agriculture. And so this canal is a very critical piece to the economy and the agriculture in that region. Um, and as happens, uh, in the past six years, there's been four years of pretty significant drought in the area. They've had one year of adequate water and then one year of surplus water, which is uh, what happened this year. They've got finally now a surplus. But with those changing conditions, um, they, they realized, uh, you know, that they needed to monitor very closely this precious resource, this water for them, um, because it's so critical to the infrastructure and the economy in that area. And so they established several permanent gauging stations all along the canal to much uh, to, to more accurately track the amount of water that they have. And that's a, a, a this is a 
an application that's suited perfectly for array. data updates of what's going on along their canal so that they can more accurately track how much water they have and just as importantly how much water they're releasing uh, for irrigation purposes. This is a, a hydroelectric uh, power plant. It's the Three Gorges Dam. It's in southeastern China. Um, it's the world's largest hydroelectric dam. It spans an entire river. And so this is a critical piece of infrastructure for that area as it provides power um, to the inhabitants in that area. And also the river is a critical piece, um, obviously, in helping to supply the power, create, generate the power, and also provide water to the area, um, the inhabitants of the area. And so, again, several years ago, they experienced a pretty significant drought that brought the, the water levels of that river to some of the lowest levels that, that uh, they had seen. And it really created this urgent need um, for them to more accurately monitor that river's water levels. And because of the accuracy and, and the longevity of the bubblers, the bubblers were, are, are used and, and set up along permanent gauging stations along that river uh, to provide the data so that they can more effectively manage, again, the resource of the water in these changing times as we experience drought. And then several years later, you know, we can experience um, increases uh, of water and so the knowledge of how much water we have just becomes critical. Here's uh, another example of a hydroelectric dam um, along the Powder River in Idaho. This is operated by Idaho Power. Um, again in this, uh, in, in this situation bubblers are used because of the permanent need for uh, gauging stations along the river and because of the high accuracy requirements. And again, like we said, um, the changing times of drought and then the surplus, um, it's just critical to know how much water we have, where the water is going, and how we're managing that water so that we can effectively manage this uh, very precious resource. Um, with that, I, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to participate here. And I am going to pass this back over to Isaac in San Diego, where he's going to He's going to talk about several different uh, Sontech products in their coastal and near coastal applications. Thank you very much, and uh, pass this back to you, Isaac. Thank you, Trent. Appreciate it. Very interesting examples. Thank you. Okay, um, so now I'm gonna I'm gonna jump into some more uh, coastal applications um, with uh, some Sontec instrumentation. Uh, the instruments can be used in, in rivers and streams, estuaries, as well as coastal environment. Um, but today I'm gonna focus more on the, the coastal some some coastal applications and, and how the instrumentation is used. So the first uh, Sontec instrument I'm going to talk about is the Sontec SL, or uh, side-looking ADCP. So the illustration here shows the Sontec SL mounted to a, a bridge pier, uh, or a, a, rather a, a dock pier. And the way the instrument works is it sends out an acoustic pulse and, and with uh, times, uh, on a time interval, it, it listens for the return signal and can measure the water velocity and cells horizontally out away from the instrument. It's also got a vertical beam which measures the water depth above it. It's got a pressure sensor and a temperature sensor. So you get all that data from, from a Sontec SL just for, for background. Um, so this, this application is uh, two Sontec SL 500s mounted on, on a pier uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. This work was done uh, by Texas A&M University and uh, there, they installed these these instruments because there isn't any at the time there wasn't any real time data of nearshore currents in the Gulf of Mexico. There's lots of data from buoys, 
um, and some, some offshore uh, installations of current meters, but there, weren't, there wasn't much data in the near shore, or there wasn't any data in the very near shore near the, the surf zone. So here you can see in this image on the top, they have um, a Sontec SL mounted uh, to the pier looking out towards, towards the ocean. So this is measuring the along shore currents out to 120 meters from the end of the pier. And then they have another one mounted um, horizontally off the side of the pier. So it's looking 51 meters out off the side of the pier. And this one is, is measuring the currents across shore, so um, either onshore or offshore currents. Um, they're, they're looking to get real-time data. So they're, they're currently getting near real-time data and supplying it via the web, so for, for surf conditions. Um, the data set could be used for, for oil spill responses, uh, which has, has been uh, very important in the Gulf following the BP oil spill, and uh, can also be used for search and rescue and, and surf conditions. So like I said, you can, you can go online and, and pull this data, or look at this data to get the surf conditions in the area. Um, and they're also using it uh, to have a, a now casting uh, wave wave height and current model, and so they're using it for, for ver verification of, of this this model. Here we can see this this first plot is of the the longshore currents, and there's uh, several different uh, lines here, um, different colors, and these are basically just showing the velocities in different different cells or, or combination of cells away from the instrument because the Sontec SL profiles the velocity horizontally and is returning cell, cell data. You can look at velocities at different distances from, from each of the instruments. This is showing the, the longshore currents and how they're at, at this time period they're agreeing in, in the cells both close to the pier and then farther away from the pier. This uh, next uh, graph is showing curves of the, the cross shore current and we see some some activity from the impact of a tropical storm tropical storm dolly and um, this actually I should have mentioned that the Sontec SL is also measuring the, the water depth uh, with acoustics and a pressure sensor it's also measuring the, the wave height uh, wave period data and it's, it's reporting that as well and so um, we see the, the longshore currents uh, farther away from the pier are, are increasing drastically right around this tropical storm Dolly event. Um, and the um, SL reported a significant wave height of 1.6 meters and, and periods of, of 10.2 seconds. So this is the, the two uh, instruments are providing a lot of data to the researchers and to, to the public via the, the web. The next example I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, includes the Sontec Argonaut XR. So here's an example of, of different ADCPs that are available from Sontec, but I'm going to focus in on our uh, kind of our lowest cost, the most compact solution, the, the Argonaut XR in this next application example. So this is a project um, that was uh, done in Bulgaria, off the, off the coast of Bulgaria where an oil pipeline was planned to be constructed, uh, bringing oil from Russia. And um, they needed some, some baseline information. So they needed uh, what current data, wave data, um, how, how energetic the environment was to see, first of all, if it was realistic to install the pipeline at this location and then to have a monitoring site for once the, the pipeline was installed to make sure that it was maintained properly and they weren't going to have damage. So here, uh, this is showing them installing a tripod that has the Argonaut XR installed. So it's, it's located in a, a gimbal here in this blow up picture on the, on the top right. And the gimbal basically, when they lower it down to the seafloor, is a, is a device that helps keep it level. So gravity helps keep the, the, the Argonaut XR looking directly up instead of at an angle if they landed on the sandbar or, or some kind of other um, obstruction. Um, along with this project, or, or as the, the Argonaut was just one piece of this project, uh, this is a good example of uh, a Xylem Analytics uh, project that includes many of our brands. So we had the Argonaut XR located on the seafloor. It was also 
um, coupled to a YSI water quality sensor and then ADVs. ADV stands for Acoustic Doppler Velocimeter, and these are basically approximate a point measurement device. So it's an acoustic device that Sontech invented in the, the early 90s and uh, uses similar principles to the Acoustic Doppler profilers, but it measures the velocity very accurately in a very small volume of water. So this is opposed to sort of a more average velocity in, in cells moving away from the instrument. The, ADVs emit a sound pulse from a transmit receiver and then receive back on, on three received transducers and can very accurately measure uh, velocity in, in a small volume of water. So this is a, a, a study done by Scripps Institute of Oceanography, some different collaborators there. Um, this is the Imperial Beach in southern San Diego County. It's the most southwesterly city and the most southwesterly beach in the United States. So just to the south off the screen here is the U.S.-Mexico border. It's a very popular beach. As you can see, it's a, it's a wide sandy beach, uh, very popular for recreation, surfing. Uh, people come to the beach. And uh, the reason this, this beach was of interest is the Tijuana River estuary uh, empties into the ocean in the U.S. just south of, of this photo. And the Tijuana River runs in Mexico for, for its duration and then comes into the U.S. right at the end and then empties into the ocean. And when they, we have large rain events like we've had recently in Southern California, there the sewage treatment plant that's on the Tijuana River gets overwhelmed and they, they have to shut down pumps and some raw sewage and untreated um, uh, the storm drain, storm, storm water gets uh, released out into the ocean and contaminates the surf zone. So there are plume maps that, that uh, will let surfers and, and other beachgoers know when it's safe and when it's not safe. It's typically not safe for 72 hours after a rain event to go in the water here. Um, but some of these are just, they're, the data is just models. It's, it's based on theoretical um, time of residence in, in the surf zone. So the oceanographers at Scripps are looking at how long uh, a, a fake contaminant, this rhodamine dye, is entrained in the surf zone, how long it actually resides within the surf zone and can be dangerous to, to beachgoers or contaminating the, the coastline. So they released this rhodamine dye and they uh, and they deployed many instruments in the surf zone and then offshore. And in the surf zone, they used uh, Sontec ADVs. And one reason for this is it's, it's very difficult to measure velocities in the surf zone because it's highly energetic. There's a lot of turbulence. A lot of acoustic meters are work very well until there's a lot of turbulence. But the ADV, since it's measuring uh, approximately a point velocity, it can measure these these values very accurately. And the, the ADV they used is shown here on the carts that they used to deploy. So they rolled these out into the surf zone and then jetted them into the sand, anchored them into the sand. And uh, these, this is the Sontec Hydra ADV, and it includes a, a pressure sensor and temperature sensor so they can measure waves, um, the water level, and, and very accurately the water velocity. And as you can see pictured here, the ADV is pointing down, so it's measuring approximately 10 centimeters from the head, so it's measuring kind of near the bed. And that's one of the things the ADV is particularly well suited to is, is measuring near boundaries because it's measuring in a very act, uh, precise location, it can be located near a boundary. So um, this, this example here um, is it's kind of bringing it all together. This is a, a port monitoring um, project that was done 
in uh, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Uh, this was an extensive project that it in included a lot of Xylem analytic uh, brands. And it was done by our, our selling partner and, and rep in the area. They're also an integrator, Hydromaris. And they, they installed um, XR ADPs off the, off the coast or, or, off, or within in the lagoon but outside of the ports. They also installed a SL wind and, and under a data logger um, right at, at the entrance to the ports. It's actually a collaboration between two different port companies and the, the, the boat pilots are um, needed this information to be able to safely uh, navigate into these harbors and, and dock the boats. Uh, one was a, a new port that was just created, and so they needed um, current data and level data to know when it's safe to enter and, and how much they could load the ships. And af after this, this project was done, um, they're able to dock ships in an hour less time, and, and one of the ports is able to use the, the real-time data to actually start bringing in ships at night when they weren't able to beforehand. So here's here's uh, a, a photo showing them installing. There's a, a Sontec Argonaut XR here in this, this tripod that they're mounting, or that they're about to deploy. And uh, they provide this data in near real time. So they were retrieving the data at five minute intervals and providing it live to the, 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 the pilots uh, on board the ships, um, the ship captains, and then also um, the, the harbor master. So they, they can view this data, and this is through the Andra GeoView software. So this brings in, brings in the, the Argonaut and SL data, the different uh, wind data. So as, as the, the ship captains are bringing the boats in, they can pull this data up and see, okay, it's safe to bring in the ship, and I can load it, and, and my draft, it's okay to have a draft of a certain amount. So this help, helps them optimize their loading and, and unloading. Um, and Hydromaris has done an excellent job of integrating this GeoView um, software that's provided by Andra into a, a smartphone app. So this is, this is available um, to to the captains on board ship via their smartphone, which is very uh, convenient. Okay, so now, um, thank you very much for, for your attention. I'm going to pass back to um, Anders, and he is going to talk about some of the solutions for measuring waves and tides and currents in, in the deep blue or, or deeper ocean. Thank you, Isaac, and uh, thank you for attending this webinar. Uh, I want to show you some applications going a little bit further out into the open uh, open sea, uh, but starting off a little bit co closer to the coast and showing you some of the applications where our wave and tide pressure-based sensors are used. I, here are some examples, barrier and dams, port operations, offshore uh, uh, applications including slope stability, moorings and autonomous platforms, cable observatories, and tsunami and flood warning systems. This is a subsea platform which is in typically installed for several years at a time, and it has acoustic communication with uh, a surface uh, buoy above, and this can be installed in deep, really deep waters. And uh, the sensors that uh, I want to mention in this, uh, in this time here is uh, our wave and tide, pressure-based wave and tide sensors, and our vented wave and tide sensors. The vented sensor has a tube inside the cable with a pressure compensation unit, which uh, compensates for the atmospheric pressure, so typically installed 
close to shore with air pressure compensation. plug and play uh, on our platforms. The pressure sensors here, they are piezo-resistive, meaning that you measure the resistance over silicon membrane and uh, the bending of the membrane tells you how much pressure you have. Our pressure sensors ha ha were first introduced in 2006 and they have turned out to be really long-term stable and highly accurate. We give uh, 0.01 percent full-scale specifications, and here you see examples of sensors coming back for recalibration after they had been in the field from uh, about here is the scale here is days, 200 days to 1,200 days, and you can see how much drift they have had during this time period, and uh, as you can see, they are most of them are well within our specifications which is 0.01% drift per year. Here is an example of sea level monitoring system in the Baltic Sea. And the goal of this system is to have sea water or sea level monitoring in real time and to make a forecast for, the, for 24 hours automatic because here flooding can happen quite quickly and flooding is known to create uh, problems in the coastal zones around this, uh, these coasts here of Estonia. And this system here is uh, done by the Marine System Institute at the Tallinn University of Technology. And it has been in operation for more than, uh, than 10 years now. So the web page, if you want to visit this, is here. You can then go in and click on the different stations. What you get then is historical, historical data you can click here and get uh, data from different time periods. And uh, when uh, the real-time data ends, the forecast starts. And here are two models that forecast the water level for the coming 24 hours. Another uh, installation which is done close by, also in the Baltic Sea, is done to prevent flooding of St. Petersburg, the second biggest city in uh, Russia. It is known, it, it, it has been historically known that there has been serious events of flooding taking both lives and uh, property. So what has been done here to protect the city uh, is to build a barrier which was 20, is 25 kilometers long and uh, this barrier is part of the city ring road and it has uh, multiple sluices and uh, giant ports which can be closed uh, in uh, when uh, flooding is uh, well, when the water level is rising and when flooding is an issue. To, to uh, monitor along these gates there are t 12 pressure sensors and uh, they are uh, all connected in real time and they are, there are also two cable connected wave and tide sensors installed just in front of the giant ship gates which you see here on, on this uh, picture. And uh, they have also installed further out in the Gulf on islands, about 100 kilometers further out. They have installed uh, uh, wave and tide two wave and tide sensors as well. And uh, all this has been in operation since 2011. And when they see that the uh, flood is coming, uh, they can close these gates and they can close the sluices along, uh, along the whole wall. Another installation which is uh, from the North Sea and in the oil fields and in deeper water where they use our uh, pressure sensors is uh, on uh, is to the, the application here is to measure millimeter seafloor movements and this is to avoid well collapse oil well collapse as they pump out oil they fill the wells with water and they want to keep uh, the pressure equal so that the oil wells do not collapse so what they have done here is that they install on our sea guard underwater instruments they install two of uh, of the pressure sensors of our pressure sensors uh, with uh, 
two sensors with different uh, different ranges to have redundancy. And before doing this, they have done thorough intercomparative tests with other technologies and found that our sensors were the most stable and uh, most, most highly accurate and with the lowest uh, noise levels. And then and the instruments are installed in multiple instruments are installed in the around the oil wells and they are uh, transmitting data in real time back to monitor this continuously here is an example from a deep sea application a deep sea mooring installed in the drake passage between antarctica and south america at around 4000 meters water depth on the right side here you see the mooring uh, it's a rather short mooring close to the seafloor in an area with really strong currents and what you see here on the on the two graphs here the red and green are uh, pressure measurements done on our sea guard on sea guard current meters and they are uh, installed about 12 meters apart and you can see how they track over a time period of 11 months uh, you see large excursions about uh, about 50 meters uh, drag down of the mooring. This is when currents are really strong. The mooring bends down and is dragged uh, down. If you look at the detail, so yeah, this uh, the purpose of this installation was uh, to compare current meters in uh, dynamic conditions in, de in deep water. And there was a paper published, uh, if you're interested in reading more about the current meter intercomparison here. If you look at the details here, you see here, this is just a short period. You can see here basically tides over uh, and how the two sensors installed 11 meters or 12 meters apart perfectly track with each other. Another good feature with our uh, uh, pressure sensors are that they are highly sensitive or so sensitive that the 6,000 meter sensor has no problem also to measure uh, air pressure when it's uh, on the, the surface and here you can see an example of this the green track here is the air pressure measurements from the weather ships weather station and the blue dots is the pressure measurement done by the 6000 meter rated sensor and an advantage with this is that you can use it for example if you have other sensors on your uh, on your sea guard instruments you can use this for example to make an air saturation verification of your oxygen optodes because at 1013 millibars they should show around 100 percent saturation and the scaling for the oxygen optodes is on this side here and you can see that the oxygen saturation here tracks with the pressure an example of an installation where uh, instruments and equipment from the free companies ysi sontec and andera is uh, used uh, together is here from uh, the Port and Harbor Safety application which is part of the Swedish DIVA system where about 100 stations are installed and running real-time uh, for ship and navigational safety. Uh, here uh, to measure currents at the harbor entrances there are two side lookers installed they measure water level temperature and the current at the entrance of the harbor. Further out there is a buoy, a YSI buoy installed with a Doppler, single point Doppler current sensor installed in a PVC tube just measuring surface currents and a acoustic profiler Doppler current sensor profiling down from the surface or from where it's installed down to the bottom measuring currents every two meters down to 18 meters water depth. And this is part, as I told you, of the Swedish navigational system uh, Viva. And here, if you want to have a look at uh, this station uh, data in real time or other of the 100 stations, you can uh, click on this link here. So finally, I want to uh, say something or introduce you to a new sensor which we have just which we have developed and have done a lot of testing on and uh, uh, lately. It's called Motus. It's a new directional wave sensor for uh, buoys and uh, uh, it's a unique way of measuring waves from, uh, from uh, hydrographic and navigational buoys and uh, its unique features and, uh, and uh, capacity will be shown at uh, Ocean or will be introduced at Ocean Business in Southampton in, uh, April, in just some weeks and uh, 
also we will have an upcoming webinar about this from uh, from Andrea. So I'm going to bring it kind of full circle, and and this is the reason for us having a, a combined webinar with the with the different brands, and and just emphasize that uh, we we are uh, Xylem Analytics includes a lot of brands that are trusted in in, in different spheres, uh, well well regarded and trusted, Andra in the in the deep sea and and ocean sphere and. And Fontech in, in the near near shore, some some oceanography and, and rivers and streams and, and YSI and waterlog and rivers and streams in the coastal zone, and and uh, we have lots of customers who um, have already been utilizing uh, some of our some some gear from each one of the brands and and putting them together for a, a total solution, and now that we're all part of Xylem Analytics. This is uh, becoming easier than ever to get a complete solution. You can come to Xylem Analytics and get um, a complete solution, and then it, it includes all of these trusted brands. This is just one last kind of in interesting example. This is a, a destroyer that they needed to bring um, uh, underneath the bridge and highlights the, the need for air gap measurement that could be uh, done using the, the Nile radar. Uh, but this same site, uh, it could also have uh, Sontec SL uh, installed for currents, uh, water level waves if this is an estuarian type environment. And then it can also have uh, water quality sensors from YSI and Andra and, and different, lots of different um, instrumentation that would be helpful for the, this, this type of site. Uh, just in increases the possibilities and, and convenience to the customer. And uh, here's here's a, another example of sort of just uh, it's a, it's an illustration of what that site uh, that I presented in, in Brazil might look like. Having a Sontec SL in, installed on the on a bridge bridge pier, uh, maybe Andra or Sontec ADCPs uh, on the on the sea floor for measuring currents and waves. Uh, buoys from either Tideland or YSI uh, and, and software from, from HiPAC or Andra. There's just a lot of different um, tools now that, that Xylem Analytics has to offer to, to in, in combining forces to provide a complete solution. And so uh, I want to reiterate on, on Andra's uh, point that we will be at Ocean Business this year uh, in the UK and uh, come come by our booth to uh, talk to the experts. We'll have many experts from all the different brands at, at the booth. So if you're going to be at this show or, or, um, or maybe interested in coming to the show, come by and visit us and you can learn more about the, the MODIS uh, wave sensor, the new wave sensor from Andra, as well as all the other instrumentation from Xylem, uh, YSI, Sontec, Andra, and, and, and others. With that, I'd like to say uh, thank you for attending, and we'll uh, answer some questions now. We're we're running a little bit long, but we have about five minutes to answer questions, so we'll we'll field some questions. And again, I'll reiterate: uh, please enter, uh, send us your questions via the chat. And if we don't get to them, I apologize, but they will be. We'll include all questions and answers to those questions in the follow-up email. That will also include a link to the recorded webinar, a uh, link to the the PowerPoint presentation, and then links to uh, pertinent information like brochures, spec sheets, that kind of thing. Um, so with that, I'll kick it off with a question uh, we've got for Anders. Um, in, in the harbor case that was shown at the end of the presentation, uh, the Doppler current sensors were mounted on a buoy. If, if waves become high and there are bubbles in the water, can these sensors still measure currents accurately? 
Uh, <clears throat> yes, we um, we have uh, we have quite much experience with this type of installations now, and also when we have been developing the motors, the new wave sensor, we have typically also installed uh, single point current sensors to measure the first meter, and then Doppler profiler current sensors to measure uh, to profile uh, downwards uh, on on the different types of uh, buoys that we have. Uh, have tested uh, the motors on, and we can see that uh, they measure currents uh, well and without no sign of of uh, yeah bad quality current meter data at least up to six seven meter waves something like that. Excellent. Thank you, Anders. And uh, here's one uh, for Trent. Um, does the Amazon bubbler have to be connected to a data logger? Um, if not, can it output directly to a modem or satellite radio? Um, the uh, the Amazon bubbler does not have to be connected directly to uh, a, a data logger. Um, it's got some internal logging capabilities, so it could be used as a, as a standalone, does not need a data logger. Um, but currently, it does not have the ability to output directly to a radio. So. Um, it can be a standalone unit, um, but you would have to then manually download data because it has some uh, internal logging capabilities. Uh, if you did want to add telemetry in the form of uh, satellite radio or cell modem, uh, something like that, then you would then have to connect to a data logger as it currently does not output directly to a radio. Excellent. Thank you, Trent. Um, and one for Sontek. Um, how do you protect the Argonaut XR or SL against biofouling? Biofouling is a huge problem for instrumentation installed in ports and harbors. Um, that's an excellent question. Um, so there's, there's a, a few things that can be done. So with the acoustics, uh, biofouling, the, the housing is not resistant to biofouling. So some kind of protection does need to, or, or cleaning schedule does need to be implemented. Um, with the XR SL, both can take a, a biofouling paint um, on the housing and then also over the transducers. One thing to note is if you do paint over the transducers um, to make sure that there are no air bubbles because if there is air that will either um, impede the signal so you don't get the, the range that you want or if it's bad enough it could, could completely block the signal. The, the frequency doesn't transmit well through air. Um, one of the advantages of the Sontec SL um, is that it can be installed on a sliding mount. So it can be um, it put into place from a pier without a diver. Uh, this also makes it very convenient for a cleaning schedule where you can just pull it up out of the water, clean, clean the instrument, and maybe reapply uh, anti-biofouling paint and then reinstall the instrument. So next. Uh, we have another question um, for Anders. For the air pressure compensated vent pressure sensor, I assume that it has an air pipe installed inside the cable. What is the maximum possible cable length that can be um, used? Yeah, so uh, for that sensor, it's typically a coastal sensor and uh, uh, it's uh, meant not to be installed deeper than uh, than 20 meters, and uh, we supply it with different cable lengths. I believe the maximum cable length we have supplied this sensor with is 80 meters, uh, but I think uh, we could go to like 100 meters or something like that. So I would say maximum cable length maybe 100 meters. Okay. Thank you, Anders. And so uh, we have one one more for uh, Trent, and then that's all. We're uh, running out of time here, but please send your questions, and we'll we'll answer them and send them in a follow up. Um, Trent, what what type of gas is used in the bubbler? It's just air. It's a it's a compressor. Um, it's a there's a built-in compressor and expansion tank, and it's just a, it's air pressure. That, that's okay, uh, so yeah, and the, being their follow-on was that they so it's, it doesn't require a nitrogen tank or replacing um, an air tank. At, absolutely not. Yeah, so it actually replaces the need for any kind of nitrogen tank. That's what's so nice about the bubbler system is that it replaces the need for any kind of nitrogen tank, and and that style of of 
of doing a bubbler. So it's all it's all integrated into one system. It's got a, an internal compressor, an internal expansion tank, and it and it monitors that line pressure and will build pressure from the Again, follow up with us if you have uh, additional questions or, or application uh, needs and, and, and things of that sort. So thank you very much.